Welcome to the first full episode of Apparitions and Alibis. I will be your podcast host, AJ Stallman. I had the idea to start this podcast because I'm a lover of true crimes and all things spooky. And I noticed that not a lot of podcasts that I personally love and listen to do stories in Virginia. So while I will be mostly covering spooks and crimes in Virginia, I also plan on covering stories outside of Virginia as well. I hope you enjoy. Today, I decided to start our new adventure together with a group of brothers that were serial killers. Go big or go home, am I right? So, I have my coffee, I have my dogs, I have my sweet bread. Let's do this. Warning, this is a true crime episode with violence and some disturbing details. There is a lot of dates and names, and I will do my best to keep it easy to follow. In 1979, Richmond, Virginia was the center of a seven-month killing spree where 11 people were victims, but investigators believed there could be up to 20. James and Bertha Briley were a hard-working couple that lived on 4th Avenue with their three sons, Linwood, JB, and Anthony. Their home was a nice two-story in downtown Richmond. The Briley brothers were lucky in that they came from an unbroken home, unlike many other children their ages. During their preteen years, neighbors recall them being a helpful bunch that was more than willing to work on cars and mow lawns for elderly neighbors. Many in the neighborhood believed the kids were polite and helpful and generally all around good boys. Their classmates, however, would beg to differ. At school, the brothers would bully and harass other students. When reprimanded by school authorities, the Briley boys seemed unbothered. They often ignored punishments given to they often ignored punishments given by teachers or the principal. Their father seemed to be the only one who could invoke fear in them. The three brothers had interest in collecting exotic spiders, snakes, and even piranhas. Side note. How does one even acquire piranhas? I'm pretty sure PetSmart doesn't just carry them. Maybe an exotic pet store? Are piranhas exotic? I don't know, man. Beyond their dangerous pet choices, they also habitually cut and saved newspaper stories about gang activity. Talk about a warning sign. When the boys became teenagers, James, the father, and Bertha, the mother, had a peaceful breakup. There was no report of drama, and it seemed very amicable. Around this time, James began to grow concerned about Linwood's actions and influence on the younger boys. Some say he grew a sense of fear of his sons and began locking his bedroom door at night. Now, I want to let you know, not only was the normal knob locked, just like a normal bedroom knob of any house, but James went as far as to put a deadbolt on his bedroom door to keep the boys out. That is heartbreaking to think about. Being a father and feeling you no longer are safe in your own home because of your children? I just wonder what changed. In the earlier years, he was the only one they would listen to, and dare I say, respected. And now he's placing a barrier between them? Maybe out of fear? When Linwood was 16, on January 28th, 1971, he was home alone when he saw his elderly neighbor, Orlean Christian, outside, hanging her laundry. No one knows what was going through his mind when Linwood decided to get a rifle from the closet, point it out of his second floor bedroom window, and pull the trigger. The shot that struck Orlean was fatal. Now, I really need to rant quick. If you are scared of your children then why the hell is there a rifle in their closet? Was it something he hid from his father? Did the father have it to protect the home? And how can James protect the home if he's locked in his bedroom trying to protect himself from his own sons? How did Linwood, at 16, obtain this rifle? Continuing on, somehow no one saw that she had a gunshot wound in her back. 
everyone assumed she had passed due to the stress of recently burying her husband. But during the viewing of her body, her family noticed a spot of blood on her dress and asked for a second examination. You go family! It was during the second examination in which they found the bullet wound. A murder investigation was opened. How do you miss a bullet wound? If you're examining a body, whether they might have died from natural causes or not, don't they check all over the body? I mean, when you're... I don't know, undressing them? Like, don't you think you would have seen a bullet? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. During the crime scene investigation, a detective used a piece of plywood to represent her body and cut a hole to represent the bullet wound. This technique helped them to find that the bullet came from the Briley home next door. There, they found the murder weapon and Lidwood confessed to the crime. He was indifferent when he stated, I heard she had heart problems. She would have died soon anyways. Yikes. Linwood was found guilty and sentenced to one year in reform school. Yes, one year. It wasn't soon after that. JB also was sentenced to time in juvenile hall for pulling a gun and firing at a police officer during a pursuit. And so... The murdering spree begins. They decided that they would be the Briley gang and they had a plan to do a series of random burglaries and home invasions. It was a simple plan. Get in, get out, leave no witnesses alive. At this time, they also had a friend, Duncan Meekins, join their group. March 12th of 1979, the Brileys found themselves in Henrico County and randomly selected the home of William and Virginia Butcher. Linwood knocked on the door. When William answered the door, Linwood claimed that he was having car trouble and asked to use the phone. Mr. Butcher said he would make the call and asked for the insurance card. Low-key, that's a really smart idea. I probably would not think of that if someone was knocking on my door. When William opened the screen door to retrieve the card, Linwood Briley rushed towards him and forced his way into the house. The rest of the gang followed behind Linwood and took control of William and Virginia, tying them up in separate rooms. The Briley's went around the home, taking any valuables they wanted. When they were done, they poured kerosene in the rooms as well as all over William's legs. As they left the house, they tossed in a lit match, the birchers still tied up inside. By some miracle, William was able to untie himself and Virginia and get them both out safely. William and Virginia are the only known victims of the Briley brothers to have survived. I cannot imagine not only thinking about, I'm about to die in a fire, but to survive and then watch the same people who attacked you carry on taking a lot of lives. Six days later, the group hit again. This time, Michael McDuffie was the victim of the home invasion. He was just a 20 year old vending machine serviceman. The Briley gang forced themselves into his home, assaulted McDuffie and robbed the home of valuables. Michael was shot to death. Two weeks after McDuffie's murder, they attacked again. Mary Gowen was a 76-year-old woman who was walking across town from her babysitting job. The men followed her home. They beat, robbed, and raped her repeatedly and then shot her in the head. Mary was able to survive the attack but she fell into a coma the next day and died a few weeks later. July 4th, 1979, a 17-year-old Christopher Phillips lingered around Linwood's car a little too long for the Briley's comfort. Assuming the boy was looking to steal the car, 
The Briley brothers forced the boy to a field where they beat and kicked him before murdering him using a cinder block. September 14th, a popular disc jockey, Johnny G. Gallagher, was playing in a band at a nightclub when he went outside to take a break. He accidentally fell right into the hands of the Briley gang, who had been searching for a victim all night with no success. Gallagher was jumped by Linwood and placed into the trunk of his own Lincoln Continental. They drove the Lincoln out to Mayo Island in the middle of the James River, where the remains of an old paper mill stood. They removed Gallagher from the trunk, robbed him of belongings, including his turquoise ring, remember this for later, and shot him at point-blank range. They then dumped his body in the river. He would be found two days later. On September 30th, Mary Wilfong, a 62-year-old private nurse, was spotted by the Brileys, and they followed her home. She was just about to enter her apartment when she was assaulted and beat to death with a baseball bat. They then burglarized <laughs> They then stole from her apartment. October 5th, not far from the Briley's home on 4th Avenue, the brothers assaulted and bludgeoned to death 79-year-old Blanche Page. They then beat and stabbed 59-year-old Charles Garner, who was a boarder of Blanche Page. According to investigators, this crime was one of the most brutal that they had ever seen. Last and certainly not least, is the Wilkerson family. On October 19th of the same year, 1979, Harvey Wilkerson and his pregnant wife, Judy Barton, and her five-year-old son lived just around the corner from the Briley brothers. Wilkerson and the brothers had known each other for years and were friends. The four would often discuss their common interest, snakes. This October 19th, the Briley boys were in a joyous mood, celebrating JB's parole earlier that day. The brothers had been hanging around on 4th Street that day, drinking and smoking pot. When it started getting dark, they began talking seriously about finding yet another victim. They brought up Wilkerson, as they thought he had been dealing drugs and figured they would take the money or maybe his customers, or maybe both. Wilkerson happened to be outside when he saw the Briley's walking towards his home. He also noticed Duncan Meekins had joined them. He then went into his home and locked the door behind him. Soon, the gang knocked on the door and Wilkerson let him in despite his fears. As soon as the group got into the home, they began to attack the couple. They were bound and gagged. And trigger warning, Linwood decided to rape Judy while in close proximity to her family. When he was finished, Meekins continued to sexually assault and sodomize the pregnant woman. Per their murderous routine, they went through the house and took whatever personal belongings they wanted. Linwood put JB in charge and left the house with some of the stolen goods. JB then instructed Anthony and Meekins to cover Wilkerson and his wife with sheets. They left poor five-year-old Harvey on the couch. Meekins then grabbed a pillow and shot through it multiple times, killing Wilkerson. JB shot and killed Judy and her unborn child. Allegedly, Anthony shot and killed the little boy. What the Briley's didn't know was that the police were actually already in the area. When they had heard the gunshot go off, they didn't know where it was coming from and began to canvas the area. They saw Meekins and the two Briley brothers leaving the Wilkerson apartment, but did not think it was connected 
to the gunshots that they heard. Dude, they were right there. They were right there. Like, it just happened. They heard gunshots and people are, like, just roaming on the street. You're not going to ask? They were right there. Are you serious? <laughs> ah! Thankfully, three days later, the police received a request to do a welfare check on Wilkerson and his family. This is when they discovered the crime scene. Even hardened officers stated it was a rough scene to handle. Apparently, before leaving the apartment, the Briley brothers set loose the family's snakes. <sighs> Jesus. <laughs> there were also two small Doberman puppies left in the home to fend for themselves. Before a forensic team could do what they had to do, animal control had to be called to retrieve the pets. But with the puppies compromising much of the crime scene, there is very little evidence. Poor puppies! <laughs> oh my gosh! And I can't imagine like walking in on that crime scene like, how, how exactly did the puppies and the snakes compromise the crime scene? I'm sure there was, like, feces and urine everywhere, but they were hungry, too. They've had to have been hungry. Oh, God. I can't. <laughs> I can't think about that. <sighs> Having seen the brothers leaving the apartment the day the Wilkerson's were murdered, they made them the prime suspects an arrest warrant was issued for the Briley brothers and Meekins. When the police went to serve the warrants, Linwood, his father, and Meekins took off in a car with the police following suit. I do wonder if they were already in the car and that's why the dad was in there or was Linwood like, get in the car or if I go, you go or something. I, I don't know, so many questions. I'm guessing they were probably already in the car. Linwood was the driver and he refused to pull over and led the police down several streets. In fear for public safety, they guided Linwood's car into a pole. After the crash, Linwood continued to run on foot, but soon was caught. Later, it was found out that the other two brothers had already turned themselves into police. Now it's time for interrogations. At this time, the only crime they could connect the men to was the Wilkerson family. With so much of the evidence being tainted, they knew their best bet was to get one of them to enter a plea bargain. Duncan Meekins was only 16 years old and did not have a background that fit a killer. He lived with parents in a nice home. He was a good student and attended church regularly. With encouragement from his family, he accepted a plea deal. He would be given a life sentence with the possibility of parole in exchange for all the details involved. If he kept his head down in prison, he would be looking at roughly 12 to 15 years. As agreed, Meekins began talking, but not only about the Wilkerson murders. He also told them about previous unsolved murders that the police had believed were random acts. The Briley boys did not have a type to whom they killed. They were different races and ages. They all had different social status and lived in different areas. Gang-related activity is usually toward other gangs. When looking at the people raped and murdered by the Briley brothers, the only major link that could be used to connect the cases was the brutality and viciousness shown by the murderers. When it came to interrogating the brothers, they were not an easy group. They were frustrating to work with. They showed arrogance, defiance, and enjoyed pushing the buttons of the investigators. When it came to the murder of the disc jockey, Johnny G. Gallagher, Linwood stated he would never be convicted of the murder because there was no evidence linking it to him. The investigators decided to bring in a retired detective to interrogate Linwood. He was actually a longtime friend of Gallagher's. When the interview began, the detective noticed a turquoise ring that Linwood was wearing. Do you remember? Right. It's the one he stole from Gallagher before he shot and killed him. 
the detective was actually with his friend when Gallagher was purchasing the ring. With that evidence and more that was uncovered, the Briley brothers were charged with various crimes and some of the murders. Linwood Briley was found guilty and given multiple life sentences and the death penalty for the murder of Gallagher. J.B. Briley was also given multiple life sentences and two death penalty sentences for the murders of Judy Barton and her son Harvey. Anthony was given a life sentence with a possibility of parole. It was not proven that he had direct responsibility for any murders. Linwood and J.B. were sent to death row at Macklinburg Correctional Center. It wasn't long before the pair had a profitable drugs and weapons racket going on from the confines of death row. Now, how the hell did they pull that off? I was just watching a video of a woman making prison pizza with Funyuns and pickles, and you're trying to tell me that they ran a whole drug and weapon organization from death row? And whose bright idea is it to send them to the same facility where this could happen? Why not separate them? Like, y'all did this to yourselves. You really did. Now, you think with them being behind bars, the story is over. It is not. On May 34th, 34th, <laughs> Ugh. on May 31st, 1984, Linwood executed an escape. He actually got out. It was said that he had a magnetic personality, so prisoners and some guards enjoyed being on his good side. Maybe the guards thought it was harmless to keep a murderer happy. After all, this prison had the most sophisticated security in the state. But Sneaky Linwood had spent years paying attention to how the system worked and the wording guards would use when making requests to other prison units. So, on that day in May, Linwood somehow got a guard to keep the door of the control room opened and another inmate rushed in, releasing the locks on all of the death row cells. This allowed enough manpower to overtake 14 guards. 14 guards. 14. These guards were then ordered to strip down and Linwood, JB, and four other inmates put on the guards' uniforms and after a series of events unfolded, they were able to drive away in a prison van. This is the state's only successful death row prison break. <sighs> These guys stress me out. <laughs> Linwood stresses me out. The plan was to go to Canada, but when the escapees reached Philadelphia, the Briley brothers separated from the group and met with their uncle, who had made arrangements for a place for them to stay. Magically, the brothers managed to stay free until June 19th. On this day, police retrieved information from the uncle's wiretapped phone about the brothers' hiding locations. They were actually arrested at a barbecue. So that had to be embarrassing. But what I didn't see anywhere was like the uncle getting in trouble for helping these guys hide. Like you would think that in s something would happen to the uncle for hiding fugitives. But I, I couldn't find anything on it. Within a short time of being brought back to the prison, Linwood and JB exhausted their appeals and execution dates were set. Linwood was first to be executed, and depending on the source, he either walked to the electric chair without help or had to be sedated and dragged to the electric chair. Either way, October 12, 1984, Linwood was executed. JB followed in Linwood's footsteps, as he had always done, and a few months later, on April 18, 1985, JB too was executed in the same chair. 
Anthony Briley remains in a Powhatan prison. All efforts for his release have been denied by the parole board. And Duncan Meekins is still serving his time in prison after being denied parole in 2009. And that is the Briley brothers, the Briley gang. There's an episode that was aired on Oxygen. So if you want more information, like, go forth and learn. I hope, I hope you enjoyed this. I'm enjoying doing it. And I enjoy learning these things. We can learn together. It's going to be a going to be a friendship of knowledge about true crime and all these other creepy things, I guess. But I hope you have a wonderful day. Please leave any sort of rating. Um, I'm working on an Instagram right now, which will hopefully be put up today after I submit this recording and edit it and all the other things that I don't know how to do yet. Um, I'm just a baby podcast. Don't come for me. But I hope you enjoyed. And I can't wait to talk to get to ta 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 to talk to you again. Peace out.